we're on. This is, uh, oh, well, welcome back everyone. This is the Hidebound Convivium, our uh, second Convivium. Uh, and this is going to be on the topic of what is the future of work, specifically the impacts of uh, automation and how they dovetail with uh, immigration and globalization, lots of uh, Asians, uh, to um, affect the workplaces uh, and the general um, macroeconomic situation of labor in the future and uh, what implications this has for uh, right-wing or right-leaning uh, political thought. Uh, so I'm going to have everyone go ahead and uh, introduce themselves, if they wouldn't mind, and then I think we'll dive uh, directly into the topic. So um, if you're new to the channel, uh, I'm uh, Hydecon. Uh, I have uh, ran this channel for about two years now, and the purpose of this channel is to discuss uh, in a uh, thoughtful but but uh, uh, laid-back and friendly atmosphere um, uh, topics including uh, education, aesthetics, politics, religion, uh, and uh, other cultural or aspects of, uh, of uh, modern culture. Uh, Clive, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm, I'm Clive DeBellish. Um, I'm a nationalist political commenter from the Midwestern U.S. Living? I'm a living being, I'm also from the Midwest. And Newt. I am Newt Traditionalist. I'm from the uh, Yankeedom. From the Yankeedom. All right. Um, so I want to begin this discussion with an overview of the topic. And by an overview of the topic, I mean an overview of the U.S. economy. Specifically, how have things changed in the past 50 years? Um, and a lot of the stats I'm looking at are specific to the last 100 years, but they'll obviously you know, in include the last 50 years. Why the last 50 years? Because uh, the last 50 years have seen a particularly worrying trend develop, especially as it relates to the U.S. labor market. Uh, specifically, what we have seen since around 1976 is that real wages for middle and lower class workers have uh, stagnated or declined, and the makeup of the available jobs in the U.S. economy has uh, shifted in such a way that it has uh, brought about several deleterious uh, social effects. Um, so just to get into some of the statistics that I have in front of me, and all of these are found uh, at the website of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and uh, a link will be provided in the description. Um, the overarching trend that we see in the past 100 years in the United States economy is that there has been an overall decline in industrial and goods production. Uh, manufacturing jobs uh, as a proportion of the, of the non-farm labor uh, peaked in June 1979. This is uh, significant because, as uh, some of the more astute uh, study years of history might know, the United States signed a bilateral trade agreement in 1979 with uh, the People's Republic of China. And this has precipitated a uh, uh, the rise of the People's Republic of China as a uh, major manufacturing center of the world economy, uh, which has only accelerated since the Chinese uh, gained World Trade Organization uh, status in 2001. Um, you'll also notice that there has been growth in several areas, specifically in health and private education. Um, food services is perhaps the, uh, the greatest and fastest growing um, uh, proportion of the labor market with a whopping 77.4% of all jobs added between December 1990 and December 2015 being in food services. Manufacturing, by contrast, was 20% of the U.S. GDP in 1947, but by 2015 it was only 12%, which represents an almost or a more than double decline in the representation of manufacturing as a uh, proportion of the GDP. Um, every year since 1976, the United States has run an overall trade deficit. Um, 
even uh, certain uh, sectors that you wouldn't think to be affected um, by trends in globalization, immigration, and so forth um, have showed at the very least a decline in overall uh, workforce due to perhaps other factors. For example, telecom employment uh, peaked in 2001 uh, and after the 2001 recession uh, never really recovered. Um, let's see, uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, real wage growth for the bottom and middle classes has been stagnant since at least the 1970s. Um, and as a matter of fact, it, it is interesting to note that if we were to compare merely the GDP of the United States in 1965, for example, which was 74.3 billion, or sorry, 743.7 billion US dollars, which equates to 5 trillion US dollars in uh, 2020 adjust, uh, inflation adjusted dollars. In 2015, the GDP was 18.22 trillion, which represents a at least threefold increase. Uh, however, as has been previously noted, uh, wages have been stagnant since uh, a little a, t a little time after 1965. Um, so that's a that's an overall snapshot of the economy that we're we're looking at. We're looking at an economy where manufacturing and goods production jobs have uh, declined as a proportion of the labor market, the non-farm uh, labor market. Um, the highest gains are in certain sectors such as transportation, uh, service, um, uh, health services, and specifically in food service. Um, and uh, even though the GDP has more than tripled in uh, 50 years, um, these, uh, the stagnation in wages has uh, continued apace. Um, so that being the case, I want to start with the first impressions uh, of, uh, especially some of the older members of the discussion tonight, um, of how work has changed uh, in their lifetime or, you know, uh, going off of their historical understanding, how they see work has changed in the past 50 years. So um, yeah. I'm going I'm to go ahead and hand it off to Clive first. Sure, yeah. I, I think it's going to be a little bit tricky for one individual to talk about their own life experiences because, of course, you know, everyone kind of has their own career trajectory during the course of their lives that's supposed to change over time. Um, but, you know, looking back at the, you know, the era of U.S. history since the end of the 60s, the last 50 years, seems to me like the, the, the biggest thing that, uh, that I notice about that is it just increased levels of competition from, you know, from uh, other countries that have lower wage levels. And, and so then the impact of that is that you you have a, a lot fewer good blue collar jobs. And one of the results of that is that there you get a lot fewer young people who plan to get into blue collar work after they get out of high school. Um, everyone feels like they need to go to college and get a college degree and then uh, get, usually get an office job. Um, and then at the same time, uh, something that people very often remark on is the sense that for people who do have office jobs, there used to be a sense um, of like mutual loyalty between the employee and the corporation that they work for, where you know there could be all kinds of up and downsides to your job, but at least you know you know if you do a pretty good job, you're probably staying with that company for your entire life. And I think uh, very very few people have that experience anymore. Okay, uh, those are uh, trends that have been noted by other people, but um, um, you know, I'm I'm glad to see we have some <laughs> uh, uh, some account of it uh, in our discussion. Yeah. Uh, I see Despot has has joined us. Uh, Despot, how are you doing? Ah, doing well. Good, good. So you you missed the first uh, few minutes of the discussion, but I really just went over 
the uh, the economics of the United States just in very broad macro terms in, in terms of uh, basically what the non-farm labor has been doing since 1915, especially uh, since 1965. Um, so the question that we're all addressing right now and that I'm going to kick over to you, Despot, is how have you seen work change in, in your lifetime? What are the expectations that workers have? What are the expectations that employers have? Um, in, and uh, how does that stack up to, say, for example, your parents' uh, experience of the workforce? I think work will potentially become more outsourced. And not just necessarily offshoring to other countries like what we see already, but also the reduction of permanent employees to have more of the gig economy mm. in which um, in the name of cheapness, in the name of efficiency, and I guess may, may also relate to the, the nature of the market and how um, there are any new businesses nowadays are usually niche things, things that are not really too big or um, things that are people want to pretty much be intelligent about certain new businesses where they want to make money while doing as little work as possible, which would mandate so much more outsourcing. Like how Uber, for example, is not, the Uber itself doesn't own the car and it simply is a place to connect people with cars and people who need somewhere to go. And I also sometimes hang around some entrepreneurial circles. There's a lot of talking of affiliate marketing drop shipping and drop servicing which is a business model in which individuals are merely just middlemen someone somewhere who has the skills can mix things someone somewhere needs to buy those things or purchase those services drop shippers and drop servicers are merely middlemen who connect these two and they get some money from that it seems now that I guess for the sake of efficiency, work has mostly been reduced to as much outsourcing as possible. Right. Um, you know, something else you, you might be able to speak to, because as I understand it, um, you don't live in the valley, do you? But you live in Southern California? I live in Silicon Valley. Okay, you live in the valley. All right. Then, then you might be able to attest this, to this phenomenon, and maybe this is just me, but it seems like there are a lot of startups that are made not with – not not with the goal of you know capturing market share or becoming a successful company but startups that are made with the express intent that they're going to be good enough at what they do that they will be bought out by a larger company and the, yes. uh, the owners can capture very them. i know that's a very common thing it's because um in the in the for profit world there is a strong incentive for after you create a successful company for you to simply sell it once you're done with it the only reason why people don't sell their companies is that they want to cling on to it because of other reasons unrelated to money. Because once you make a big company and you sell it to another company, I mean, it's still going to work fine. It's not like that company buying it will ruin it. It's just now you don't have to work with it and you have a couple million dollars. So um, for the for-profit world, there are real incentives for you to just simply do that as a kind of business model. Right. Well, I'm going to kick it over to Living. Uh, same question that I asked everyone else. So <clears throat> I come from a former manufacturing hub. And um, it's, you know, you mentioned the food service and healthcare services being the fastest growing job sectors. And the, the thing about those two, two services is they serve to maintain an existing population, but they don't actually provide any value that could lead to a profit or surplus coming into the community. It's not, you know, whereas Detroit used to produce cars and selling those cars all over the world brought money to Detroit that could then be spent on food services or healthcare services or goods or, you know, just to be circulating in the economy, currently there is a net drain on the resources of the community. It's definitely running a deficit, not just an economic deficit, but like a value deficit, like no longer can produce and compete in the global market uh, in a way that will bring that liquidity to the local economy so 
interestingly, the, the fastest growing job sectors being healthcare services and food services, those are things that serve to uh, maintain the local populace, but not um, not ultimately be economically competitive in a global market. And what is really needed to succeed in the modern global economy is to be producing some value that can compete globally. And America is not doing that at the moment. Yeah, it, it seems like, to go back to our previous convivium, um, the situation in Detroit is that there's so much consumption and not any more production. Would that be fair to say? I, I can you, you, you uh, robot out. it out pretty bad there. Oh, did I? Uh, am, I back with, am I back with you guys? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so with regard to Detroit, it is like, because there's not any value being produced that can bring, uh, you know, result in a surplus and, and um, bring liquidity to the, to the eco local economy, what is sustaining these healthcare services and these food services, these jobs, um, ultimately is it's di still digesting the former um, affluence of the area. I mean, there is still some production going on. I mean, it's not like there's no businesses in the area that um, do business nationally or internationally, but largely what drives that service-based economy is a sort of digestion of the previous wealth that was brought at a time when the, we were running a surplus, a trade surplus. Right. Uh, well, and it's So it's not a sustainable situation. The fact that it's food service and healthcare services as an indicator that it's not a sustainable, uh, not a sustainable situation. Well, and eventually it was a, it's, it was a time drain, in history that everything. was, I'm excuse me. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it was a time in history that was uh, historically um, anomalous that brought uh, so much wealth to Detroit in the first place. Uh, and, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why there's so much, it seems like there's so much wealth uh, to digest uh, in some of these. Is uh, industry anomalous, though? Because right now you have the, the southern China as an industrial manufacturing center and is that a temporary anomalous situation that is going to pass and then they will digest their wealth i mean is industrialization necessarily a temporary condition um, is this part of a larger market cycle or is there a broader trend away from i mean there can't be a trend away from manufacturing entirely. Cause... Well, it's more that there's a trend in manufacturing towards areas where labor is is uh, cheap, right? For sure. You know, it's it's like capital is is one of those things. It's an anomaly. Um, I would say that you know, in the long run, an unsustainable situation can't be the norm. Um, however, it's it's probably worth notice. Yeah, probably worth noting that the United States in the 1950s was one of the most prosperous times and places in human history. So there may, it, you know, the degree of productivity might be a, a, an anomaly. Well, and I, I think that's a fair argument to make is is that the this the historical situation that the United States found itself in at the end of the Second World War, where it had all these industries built up from providing a war industry for like half the world for two world wars, um, and then all of a sudden it is you know the unchallenged hegemon of again half the world, um, all of these. Uh, you know any any sort of industrial um, competitors that it might have had, France, Britain, 
uh, Japan, Germany, have been absolutely bombed to hell, um, and they have no industrial base, and a lot of them, you know, are um, are in uh, bad situation. A lot of countries are in bad situations with regards to their relationship with the United States and uh, foreign trade. Uh, so the United right. States having its industrial base and able to supply the whole world with uh, cheap manufactured goods uh, put it in this anom uh, uh, anomalous situation in, in terms of world history. Because not even in, you know, the last world-spanning empire before the, uh, before the United States, um, or I guess the, the last world-spanning empire... Uh, that people tend to compare to the United States would be the Roman, the Roman Empire, and they didn't have, mm. you know, they didn't have this kind of economic, um, like total economic hegemony, uh, so to speak. Yeah, right. Has anyone heard of the saying, "My success is not enough; others must fail"? Right. That's basically what made 1950s America so perceived to be so prosperous and great. Policies alone are not really enough to bring this purported golden age back. The entire world must be broken so that the only thing left would be America. Yeah. Well, it... well right. And, and so right, I, I agree with that, that the you know, policies may or may not be able to get us back to a point. Uh, or I guess uh, policies are not necessarily going to be able to get us back to things being as good as they were in the 50s. But nevertheless, I, I mean, that's what makes the question of the future of work so pertinent is as we as we, you know, as we come down from that height, uh, wh where do we go? Because it, it doesn't it won't do just to say, well, things were good in the past and obviously they must become bad in the future and we're doomed. That's pointless. Mm hmm. Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and kick it over to Newt uh, because he's been sitting and waiting patiently to talk. And uh, then we can move on to our, our next topic. Uh, so how does that sound? Sure. No problem at all. And thank you. Um, I'm a millennial kind of adjacent to the tech sector. So one of the things that was kind of prominent to me as I graduated high school was this idea that you go to the best college, regardless of location for whatever field you're going into, and you find the best job. And then you kind of monkey, monkey branch um, onto the best kind of opportunity that pops up. A consistent trend that I've seen in like the limited time that I have um, in the working world is this decrease in loyalty, decrease in um, localism, and decrease in vocationalism. Whereas before you would want to be a career man at a particular job, this is kind of like what Clive was saying. Uh, whereas before you'd like have 30 years at a given company um, in a consistent sort of job, and you'd be the milkman or you'd be the butcher. Um, now everyone's asking that we have our like we have a side gig and we have a hustle and we have. Um, you're in a job for two years, and then you find a 10% raise moving to the next job in whatever city you're in, uh, whatever city you move into that might have the best job. So there's, yeah, the, the dehumanization, delocalization, um, and kind of the time scale has shifted from a career vocation, uh, who you are as a person, integration to your life, into something that's just really finding the best opportunity in the quickest amount of time. Well, and, and that's, I mean, that comes down to, you know, one of the, one of the problems that's been brought about by, um, you know, an increase in transportation technology is that, you know, capital, capital has always been kind of movable in the, in the sense, or uh, not capital necessarily, but fungible wealth that you need to build capital has always been movable. And you can go different places, you can buy more capital somewhere else. Um, but historically, labor has been uh, not particularly mobile. Uh, now we live in an era where um, where labor has become more mobile than it has ever been in the history of the human race. And um, you know, I've seen st uh, statistics that have uh, said that basically people are becoming less mobile. Um, as they basically uh, stop being able to afford to move to take uh, different positions. Um, however, it does remain the fact that uh, there is an expectation in uh, American culture that um, you that people are intended to pick themselves up and move themselves to wherever the um, opportunities for acquisition of wealth are the greatest. And this is a 
this is again a historically anomalous um, sort of uh, maybe not totally anomalous, but uh, to the to the scale and uh, normalization that or or uh, level of normality that we've uh, put this to, uh, it is fairly anomalous. Right. Or, or just to be clear, I just want to underline that you know, the, the traditional norm that you're talking about in the U.S. is that people will move to other places in the U.S. for a job, or maybe in Canada, not to Argentina or the Philippines. Right. And that's, that, is the, uh, that is the one thing about globalization, right, is that um, you know, uh, companies can be global, but workforces can't necessarily. There's a tech startup I was talking to before um, that was mentioning that kind of at the conclusion of the American Workday is near the start of the Australian one. So if someone was really, you know, an upstart and wanting to get a get ahead in the tech sector, they would try and farm out extra hours in addition to their 40 hours, 40 hours a week at their current company to do 10 or 20 on the side for some some company in Australia. So that's you're sitting at one computer in one terminal in somewhere in America, just trying to see what hour it is in what other corner of the globe that would allow you to have an additional set of income from your current one. Um, it's a pretty crazy, scary world there. Right. Well, I think we've talked uh, quite at length about, you know, our, our own impressions of uh, how the, the world of work has changed for us in our lives or how we've, uh, how we've, seen it change in regards to maybe what our parents have have been through um so you know just just to uh briefly uh, uh cover the topic of automation because uh, that's going to dominate most of our discussion um this the topic of automation is going to dominate this discussion because it is the sort of uh looming scary 900 pound gorilla that's sitting in the corner of the room and everybody knows that it's there. Uh, nobody wants to. Uh, nobody wants to talk about it, or if they want to talk about it, they um, they they really want to stretch and, and uh, be able to tell everybody that everything's going to be okay. And everything very well might be okay. I'm not saying that it, it won't. It's just that um, you know there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of of a dismissive attitude in regard to the role that. Uh, future automation will have in the U.S. workforce. And I want to sort of address the question that always comes up uh, first, which is, you know, how is this any different than when the uh, mechanical loom was invented and the Industrial Revolution began in England? Or how is this any different than, uh, you know, mechanized farming brought everybody into the cities, you know? Um, you know, People in uh, the early industrial revolution in England were, you know, uh, screaming and, and shouting and saying, well, this is the, like the end of the world. No one's going to be able to live anymore because these machines are just going to put everyone out of business. And they went around um, smashing uh, looms and, you know, doing things like that. And it, it, it became so endemic uh, in England that the authorities made uh, – machine breaking a capital offense and there were uh, labor riots uh, in the uh, early 19th century in England um, and it, it by some historians standards it's really a miracle that there wasn't a wider uh, sort of um, socialist or left-wing uh, movement of labor uh, in England um, but that being that, that being the case that's the first question I want to address is how is you know the f the how is factory robots and driverless vehicles and self-serve sales kiosks how is that going to be different than the mechanical loom or the assembly line or the tractor so anyone want to anyone want to take that question first Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll address that. I mean, ultimately, you know, to take Uber as an example, self-driving Uber, right? It, the, the effect of that and other similar technical advances is simply that it puts wage pressure on 
whatever other types of jobs that people end up having to do instead of driving for Uber or, or whatever else is being automated. Now, in the case of the Industrial Revolution, I'm not an expert on the economic history of that of that period. And obviously, as, as we know, a lot of people actually did suffer and have their quality of life harmed by those developments for sure. But at the same time, to the best of my understanding, the, the, the um, technical advances at that time were also creating new and higher paying jobs that people were moving into as they moved out of whatever their, whatever the, the old jobs that were common before that were. And so therefore we'll see the same results now if the automation actually does that and creates new and better and greater jobs that people can, can move into instead. So I guess, the, I guess the question is, are those jobs coming? And I, I, am, I, I tend to, to I'm, I'm skeptical on this question. Um, yeah. Now I'll entertain a, a counter argument, right? So in my research for this uh, discussion, I came across a TED talk by a gentleman whose name I don't remember, but his, you know, his his general shtick was that uh, automation in general. Um, does not actually get rid of labor. It just um, it just makes labor um, better. It augments labor, and uh, and he uses as an example the fact that automatic teller machines were introduced, you know, sometime in the 1970s. But the actual real number of bank tellers since the 1970s has increased. Uh, due to the opening of more bank branches. And now bank tellers do something different than actually telling. Um, they're you know, more like uh, salespeople and they, um, or customer service representatives, uh, so to speak, than actual what we would think of as being a bank teller. Um, but he uses this counterexample, and his entire thesis really relies on the idea that uh, what automation does is it... it um, it makes individual human labor uh, more productive because essentially when you have a, a chain of processes that make a product and he, he so he uses the example of um, uh, the Challenger explosion and in the Challenger explosion they figured out that the the um, the thing that caused the explosion was a frozen o-ring just a, a mechanical device that uh, if it had been uh, checked uh, before launch or if it hadn't have frozen before launch uh, everything would have would have gone well and it, he compares human labor in a automated system to being this o-ring in the sense that as automation takes uh, menial human labor away uh, in you know farms and factories that the work that human beings do will sort of uh, increase in value because they have all the value added of these um, of these cheaper processes uh, cranking out more uh, in terms of product uh, so they are in a sense the critical link in the chain um, and the main problem I had with this thesis was that while while this is true right that uh, if you have a, a supply chain for example where robots take over a certain section of the um, of the uh, chain of supply, it naturally means that whatever chain is left run by humans is a, you know, it's smaller, there's less people, so the value of, of their labor has gone up, but also the importance of their labor in, in regards to the rest of the chain and, and all the human labor input into the system has also increased. But, I, you know, I, I look at that and say, yes, and that's why those people need to have their jobs automated too. Like if, if you're looking at, um, if you're the if you're the company exec, right, and you're looking at this, you you have to be thinking, okay, you know, I've wiped out, uh, you know, everything I possibly can, and you know, I'm I'm spending all my energy on trying to figure out how I can get these, um, you know, these uh, these middle managers who do this weird, um, who do this weird process that can't be automated just yet. I have to figure out how to get rid of them. And a lot of uh, thinking would naturally go into how to, um, how to replace these people. And I think, 
you know, through advancements not just in hardware, like the ability to have these robots with articulated arms, uh, but also in, in software, uh, has, has made most human jobs obsolete. And even if, even if you have a job that a human being really needs to be able to do to get the full effect of it, so I would, I would consider a job like teaching, for example, to be a job that really only a human can do very well. Because I've seen people try to uh, teach themselves something like online or go through like an online like self-directed course or something, and uh, it's not helpful. Uh, nine times out of ten, and people don't learn very well that way. Uh, however, um, if you know schools, for example, uh, school systems, or if uh, colleges or or whoever is in charge of the, that decision decision making decides that the the quality of these online courses and the quality that they're turning out is worse, but the advantages that they've gained from essentially eliminating their most of their human um, teaching workforce uh, makes up for the the um, lack of quality, the the efficiency loss that they're getting right. in lack of in lack of quality. Um, and uh, it, it it might be five times five times lower quality, but twenty times cheaper. Right, exactly. And when you have a paradigm like like this guy, and I, I I hate that I can't remember his name, uh, but I also hate that I'm bashing him and he can't defend himself. So maybe it's better. But you know the whole problem with his thesis is that his his thesis ends up with the giving people the motivation to keep automating, and uh, you know just just the technologies that I touched on, right? Like um, like driverless uh, cars, for example, driverless vehicles, autonomous vehicles. Um, driving and transportation makes up a huge, huge section of the uh, U.S. economy. It's like there are like millions of truck drivers, uh, cabbies who are already getting squeezed out by Uber. Um, and, you know, they're just going to have their jobs pretty much vaporized uh, almost overnight. Um, because not only are autonomous vehicles uh, safer than human drivers, but they're way cheaper. Uh, so, uh, uh, I I I feel like I've forgotten my original point because I've I've gone so far afield. Um, but well, it, I, I think I remember what your original point was. It, it, it's to raise the question of you know what are these new jobs going to be that, that yeah. replace the old jobs lost to automation. Right, because we, we, you know, we found out, you know, when we when we invented the spinning jenny, or when some English guy invented the spinning jenny, like people figured out other things to do. Um, however, uh, you know, it, it's not exactly clear that in our our current paradigm, you can just put like thirty million people out of work and say, "Sorry, sucks to be you." Um, also, uh, learn to code, bro. Uh, and that just yeah. I mean, I've been told that if you know how to put coal into a furnace, you can learn that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one one thing I did want to touch on as, as well, while we're talking about you know relative job losses, is that uh, if you'll think back to my overview of the U.S. economy, um, you know we're looking at what did I say, 77% of all non-farm job growth in between 1990 and 2015 was in food service. Is that, is that correct? I think that's right. Um, good. If, if you think about that and compare that to um, <laughs> compare that to all these self-serve kiosks that you see popping up at every McDonald's, and then you start, you know, it you think about how hard is it really to automate the process of making a burger? How hard is it really like, and it, it, it's not even necessarily that you could have an entire McDonald's that has nobody in it, because I don't think we'd ever get to that point, but like how hard would it be to design a McDonald's that you only need one, you only needed one or two people to work it. And those one or two people do basically nothing except uh, clean and maybe repair and maintain the machines and talk to customers if they have some sort of problem or, you know, clean the lobby or whatever, whatever those two people would do. Um, 
and you know like a, a McDonald's staffs like maybe maybe ten people, uh, like the typical McDonald's, and you got to think about how many like like thousands of McDonald's are just across the world. You wipe out you know eight of those ten people. What you know what do they do? Uh, and this is already people who can't find anything better to do than work at McDonald's. So well, maybe we could build five times as many McDonald's. Yeah, maybe we could. <laughs> Perhaps I, I don't know if that would necessarily meet with a consumer demand. I know many people would like McDonald's, but five in a single location that maybe if you're a big city perhaps but <laughs> right and this is the problem with the uh, automated teller bank teller example is that when ATMs were introduced there was still there were still places you could build new bank branches like there were more banks banks expanded into different towns now every small town has you know like one or two banks in it um this but is the like, problem with delocalization, right. is that there's an infinite area where, in which you can expand, um, and expansion is much, much less costly than it ever used to be. And this problem is exponential, not, ge not geometric. As things get easier and easier to go to the next level, um, and the problem of, you know, we're so, so connected to the other side of the world just digitally, um, there's very little tangible negative effect to outsourcing to a different location, and there's a much, much greater amount of either surplus labor for very, very cheap, or new markets to exp expand and, ex and exploit. Um, right. So it will expand until it reaches the globe. Um, but yeah, but, but a, a, a company like happening. a company like McDonald's has almost, like, almost basically reached world saturation. Like, there are probably more McDonald's in the world than there are places of worship. Or pretty, close to or, or pretty close to it. I mean, I, I don't have the exact numbers on that, right? But um, but it does seem like a corporation like McDonald's has reached total saturation. And and, that, and that's just one example, right? Um, you could do that with any fast food chain. Because um, as I said, food service, a.k.a. fast food, because that's the majority of, of what all restaurants are these days, um, is... 77 percent of all job growth and as far as i know the numbers between 2015 and 2020 have probably kept that uh track i mean i work in food service there's nothing there's there's nothing else for people in a small town really to do like i, I didn't talk about this when i uh opened opened the discussion but in the small town in tennessee where i live your options are basically food service or there's like a handful of uh, factories that pay basically the same um for like really crappy hours really crappy job uh and so you just think well i i think i would rather i would rather flip burgers than um uh, you know like work in the rolled steel plant for uh eight dollars an hour you know whatever yeah. whatever the case may be um but um at least that rolled steel plant is creating some value that is bringing in money from outside sources instead of merely maintaining and sustaining the local yeah and, not and to say that that's better but that is the one that is the one good thing the only the only thing is like it's almost predatory you know the way that all, all of these all these small manufacturing um, places they come to uh, places in the South because labor is cheap because they know that they don't have to pay people ten dollars an hour they don't have to give people benefits or uh, mm -hmm. anything like that and um, if you know labor around here was to unionize or you know whatever the case may be um, that would just you know put the kibosh on the whole thing I mean so taking examples in Tennessee there is a Volkswagen plant in Knoxville the uh, labor was going to unionize in Knoxville, and um, I'm a little bit fuzzy on the specifics, but basically the governor himself got uh, – or the uh, former governor before he was governor, was mayor of Knoxville, uh, got involved in quashing the uh, unionization um, of the uh, plant. But Because um, otherwise they'd be running a deficit. Right, because otherwise Volkswagen would 
pack up and get out. Um, right. So, and if I, all you have is local services, then the local area doesn't last for very long. Right. No, and, and this, this actually is, just remind. Go ahead, Desmond. Uh, this actually just reminds me. I just had a thought about when we were discussing about the mindset of the localities in regards to this economy. I was just thinking the places where corporations put their headquarters, the places where the rich share, rich shareholders and rich managers live, those wealthy neighborhoods and wealthy parts of cities. It's funny to think that from our perspective, we perceive ourselves as, let's say, fighting for the benefits of the locality. But what I can say we're really fighting for is for poor localities. Because certain rich localities can perceive what they're doing right now as in their benefit. That's an interesting thought. Well, yeah, I think there's, I think there's no, um, I mean, I think we should just come right out and say it, right? That the, the communities that specifically are going to take the brunt of the impact, and the communities that have already taken the brunt of the impact, are poor, usually rural, but not always white communities. Not, not to make it necessarily um, like all about race, just like that is the demographic of people that's been most affected. Um, and in covering our, um, in covering immigration in uh, further on in the discussion, we'll, we'll probably get to that. Um, I just want to give. Well, before you get to that, Hydecon, that I'm, I'm not. Uh, you I'm not said something that, earlier. But go ahead. You said something earlier about um, the value added by automation. Yeah. And you seem to be implying that that value was somehow transferred onto the laborer themselves. Whereas what actually happens in these situations is that any surplus value created by the automation doesn't go to the laborer. It certainly doesn't go to the laborer that lost his job, but it doesn't go to the other laborers either. If anything, there's increased competition for their job and their wages go down. Any increase in efficiency, an increase in production, increase in profits that comes along with the automation gets funneled to the owner class, essentially, places like Silicon Valley. And that's why places like Silicon Valley can have so much money without a lot of actual work. Uh, not to say that they don't, they're not working, you know, but I mean, like, well, labor, I without a lot of labor going on. Perhaps I can correct a misunderstanding. I didn't mean to say that they got paid more because their work became more valuable because of automation. What I mean to say is that their, uh, their importance as laborers to the supply chain became increased, um, which, as I, as I said, um, sort of... Um, incentivizes the higher ups to automate their profession, because you know, uh, in in some instances it would lead to wage growth. In in some it wouldn't. It would depend. Well, I think it would like concentrate the the, um, the 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 benefit. It would concentrate the benefit on a smaller number of people. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned also, you said you mentioned about teachers and you're saying, oh, well, you know, they'll never automate teaching because people don't learn as well. But um, no, that's I think a lot I, of people do learn as well, or at least like well enough that on the balance of the equation, if you can learn from the best teacher in the world via YouTube and, you know, submit your questions or whatever, you our benefit like i can take a psychology class from jordan peterson you know that's for free and he can teach there's there there's no additional cost per unit of students for him to publish his videos on youtube millions of people can go take his personality and its transformation course and yeah. derive the same value and he only had to teach the course one time and this is very much analogous to what happened to musicians in the advent of recording technology in that it used to be everybody had some sort of musical ability because it was the only way to experience music was to make it yourself or to be in the presence of somebody making it 
and then the best musicians would have lots of work playing their music around because the only way you could hear music is to have professional, you know, or have musicians around making it. But when they developed recording technology, then it became only the very best musicians. It became winner take it all. On the radio. Yeah. Yeah. It became winner take all. And the same thing's going to happen with teaching. It already is happening with teaching. Yeah, I, th- I um, think I think again this is a this is a misunderstanding. Um, what I what I did say is that, I, although I didn't necessarily touch on it to that degree, I, I said that uh, I do believe that the quality of teaching is negatively impacted by the, our what our current standards of online education are. Um, however, um, I suggested that the efficiency gained from online uh, classes that are run without uh, the supervision of, of teachers or with the supervision of less teachers uh, would create such an efficiency gain that even if the quality of the education suffered, um, it would probably be worth it to uh, those making the decisions to go ahead and uh, eliminate those positions. Like, why does a video game cost $60? It cost a lot of money to develop the video game. There's certainly a lot of like upfront investment in its production, but once it's made, however many you sell, it doesn't cost any extra to have another download. And so what is the price of the video game? Well, it's whatever people will pay for it. And there's no ceiling on the profits that you can, that you can achieve from publishing a video game because Specifically for video games, yeah, no one wants to purchase above sixty dollars, and that's why there's a phenomenon of too many micro microtransactions in DLC because they need more money, <laughs> or maybe I'm not sure if the developers need more money. There's a controversy about this whether if it's the developers need more money to pay for their salaries, or if it's shareholders. I'm not sure. But so far, there's a pressure for the video game industry for a lot of microtransactions to exist just so they can further enrich themselves. I'm not. Sh- I'm still unsure if it's justified or not, or if it's just the shareholders doing what they do best. Um, one of the things I we wanna... live in an era of unlimited duplication mm-hmm. of digital. And, and as as Skellington would argue, it is not against Catholic social teaching to pirate uh, uh, digital materials because. Mm-hmm. It is the nature of files to be reproduced. <laughs> um, but I, I want to get uh, to Newt. I want to give him an opportunity to weigh in on the uh, on the question right now, um, which uh, if someone w- will fill me in, what what are, what exactly are we discussing at the moment? <laughs> are we are we still on the topic of, of why why this ain't your grandma's industrial revolution? Yeah, I, think I really think the application of Moore's law is one of the most important aspects to understanding it. Um, once you restrict and take away the locality constraints and the momentum of you know a previously more traditional, more industrialized, more localized society, and you bring in all of the technology, um, that just does have the Moore's law exponential graph. Could, could um, you, that unless could you, explain, you really fight against it, could you explain Moore's yeah. law for the uneducated? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Moore's law is basically just that uh, it came originally from microchips. That's not super important, but the idea is that with any sort of advancement in technology, um, the corresponding advancements in technology will help the next advancement come about more quickly. Um, so that instead of it just being kind of some sort of linear progression of things get you know better at a one x rate over time, um, every succeeding, every successive development in this sort of space. Um, makes the next development much easier okay so with a um with less localism an easier way to to reach across the continents even um again the huge glut in the market every step towards globalism makes the next step towards globalism much easier every step towards the gig economy makes like vocationalism much more difficult to return back to um so it's no longer it's, it's not going to be this like there's this idea that uh, you know we bring about the tractor and people still farm, but if you if you bring about a gig economy that stretches across the entire globe, um, <laughs> there's it's very hard to go back from that, and it's not something like a an incremental change in technology. It's a it's a huge 
um, paradigm shift in how we consider a workday, um, a job, anything. All right, Despot, did you want to say something? Nothing in particular. Oh, okay. Um, well, in that case, I think w what I wanted to actually do was move on to immigration uh, and uh, globalization um, in more detail before we eventually turn back to the question of, like, how are we going to deal with the the post the post industrial post automation um, uh, future of capitalism and and uh, you know how do we approach this as right wing people? Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of the, of the the question of of automation and globalization because I think what automation and globalization represent is uh, basically sorry immigration and globalization and I, I think what these two forces represent is like the the um, they're in some sense the harbinger of automation because they do everything that automation does, but they just do it a little bit less efficiently, um, to my mind, right? So, um, you know, in in terms of immigration, right, the you can think of a percentage of the U.S. population that is foreign born. In 2018, 44 million people in the United States were foreign born or 14% of the population, and only 2 million of those uh, were children. Um, compare this to, ne so, so you're talking about 42 million people in the workforce that are not children. In 1965, the foreign-born population was 5%, um, which I, I don't know what that is proportionally, or, or sorry, in real numbers of the population in 1965, but proportionally, we have three times more foreign labor in the U.S. workforce than we did 50 years ago. Um, and the, some people will be astute and will pick up on the date, 1965. This was, of course, the passage of the Hart Seller Immigration Act, um, which uh, sort of opened up the, the doors to uh, a greater immigration, from, especially from areas of the world that uh, offered lots of uh, cheap labor, so to speak. Um, and I, and I want to come back to uh, another point, which is um, the role of women in the workforce. Um, the women labor force participation rate uh, peaked in 1990, or sorry, 1999 at 60%. Um, and I believe currently we're hovering uh, right around, uh, right around 60% for female uh, workforce participation. So, you know, take whatever whatever percentage of the 300 and some odd million people in the United States, and you take a quarter of those that, that um, sorry, you take half of those that would normally not have been in the workforce, and you take a little bit over half of them, so a quarter of the population that normally wouldn't have been in the workforce, they're now in the workforce. So that represents something like uh, 75 million uh, just to do a rough, a rough estimate, um, and I think this, you you can look at this, uh, both of these factors as compounding the problem of labor glut. Uh, I encourage uh, all of the viewers of this video to actually go back and take a look at the uh, economics explained video that I'm going to link uh, to this video, just because I I found it really helpful, and he talks a lot about the uh, the supply of labor. Uh, you know, relative to the demand. And what we've seen in the United States is that uh, even though the uh, GDP has increased by like threefold since 1965 in terms of real dollars, um, the, the stagnation in wages we can attribute in some part to the fact that the labor pool in the same period of time has grown not only more than it would normally have, uh, just by, you know, more men being born and coming of age into the workforce, but it's also being supplemented by 60% of all women now in the workforce. Uh, and, you know, not only that, we can look at trends in higher education where more women than men uh, graduate from college, so more women than men get those, um, those sort of comfy jobs that uh, are uh, 
uh, college educated, so called skilled, uh, post secondary requiring um, uh, positions. So that's that's going to, to more women. So the the um, you know the net effect there is that uh, the jobs left for men to do have diminished, and then within that paradigm, the the remaining native U.S. men are having to compete with 44 million uh, non uh, uh, non native. Uh, people living in the United States, uh, so either immigrants, or I think that also includes um, deferred action for childhood arrivals um, persons as well. Um, but that also doesn't include the children of previous immigrants, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, really, given uh, the the immigration that that uh, occurred after the 1965 Hart Seller Act, you're really probably looking at uh, more than 50 million uh, people in the workforce that, under you know, uh, under previous circumstances, under circumstances not influenced by the Hart Seller Act or by any other uh, immigration policy that the United States could have put into place, and if the United States had a more restrictionist immigration policy, then you could keep as many as uh, 50 million uh, additional persons out of the 2020 or, or 2015, from whenever these stats are, U.S. workforce. And so uh, if anyone wants to opine on the... Um, you know, maybe some examples that they know of, specifically of this this um, this ability of uh, women and uh, immigrants entering the workforce, driving down wages. Um, if we could comment on that for a bit, and then we can move on to the other topic, which is uh, globalization and outsourcing. Uh, so, would anyone like to volunteer to speak? Don't everyone speak at once. Yeah, I really, I really think that um, basically no one who hasn't been thoroughly uh, propagandized looks at the United States and thinks there just aren't enough people. And so ultimately, I mean, what we're talking about are various factors that are, just as you said, creating a, creating a, a, a labor glut. And I mean, that's, that's, the, that's, what they teach you on the first day of economics class is supply and demand that can't do anything other than drive down wages. Right. You, you seem to be saying there, um, it, it, and maybe I'm uh, misunderstanding you. But mic you, problem. Am I having mic problems? I don't, I don't, that's that's not going to show up for the people watching the video, but it will show up uh, for you guys, unfortunately. Um, can, okay. can you hear me okay? Yeah. Sounds better now. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know if I understood you correctly. Did you say that um, that there are not enough people in the U.S. workforce? Did you say there were too many? No, I was um, – yeah, I was saying that, that no one who hasn't been thoroughly propagandized would say that there aren't enough people in the United States. Right. Um, right. Except, of course, I mean, just for, for, for anyone who doesn't already know this, the, 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 the reason that our political parties are in favor of high levels of immigration is that the Republican Party largely represents business owners as one of its main constituencies. So if you're in the position of owning a lot of capital and hiring other people to work, then sure, it benefits you to have more workers. All right. Any anyone else want to tackle that topic? I think just it should be noted that what is counted and is not counted in GDP is significant. Um, a bunch of women entering the workforce means that we now have a giant giant need for um, daycare workers um, and people calling their not their mother's mother, but their, you know, their daycare workers going attached to um, pretty much strangers, albeit strangers, um, instead of their parents and the loss of familial bonds. Um, there are tremendous costs that don't, don't necessarily show up in GDP numbers or economy numbers, um, but in the oikos, in the home, um, that's where it really counts. 
Yeah, right, and th that's true. And I don't want this to be uh, overly uh, materialistic or, or uh, overly statistical uh, outlook on the on the question. Now, uh, there is no no question that the daycare industry has probably grown exponentially given these uh, changes in female workforce participation. Uh, just just because I know f uh, that um, childcare is ridiculously expensive. Um, but of course, this is always treated by political leaders as a reason why we need uh, free, um, you know, free pre-K and free this and free that, and and uh, you know, we need to reduce yeah. the the price of childcare so we can get more women into the workforce. Um, and I I think you know, it, you, it's if, every so often you you come across a couple who. You know, they for the first few years of their marriage, they were both working a job, and then all of a sudden, the wife realizes, or they both realize, like, hey, if I just stayed home and just like cooked and watched the kids, then the amount of money that we would save in daycare, in calling out to eat, and all these various other things would, you know, actually like is more than the amount of money that I make at my job. Um, I don't think that's a that's an uncommon uh, phenomenon, and you know I, I singled out immigration as a as a major issue, but there's also this um, there's also this issue of getting more women into the workforce, which, as Newt has noted, uh, or a new traditionalist I should say I shouldn't be mean to him, um, a, as he's noted, uh, it um, it decreases quality of life for uh, women and uh, children. Um, and and men to some extent, although they're not the the primary victims of that, I would I would suggest. Um, so we, we do have to be wary of that. Also, the the non economic uh, cost to um, greater uh, female workforce participation. Um, that is not to say, of course, that women don't have any place in the workforce. Uh, just that as in a, a there's a general societal expectation that seems to be unfounded and seems to be wholly self serving for the capital uh, owning class that uh, women are expected uh, to uh, work. Um, There's also even more effects of this phenomenon in that, you know, you say 70% of new jobs created are in food service. Well, if both parents are working or if everybody is working, then there's nobody at home to cook dinner. And so there's more purchasing of prepared foods and takeout and it, it, it feeds right. the food industry, the food service industry. And I would wait. Right. And, and, the... and, Go ahead. Just, just to underline the point that new traditionalist was making all of that people eating at McDonald's instead of cooking at, at home, looks like a good thing if all you're measuring is the size of GDP. Mm. And I, I would also add that um, I think the expansion of, uh, of uh, food service, so to speak, because when we say food service, we really mean mostly mean fast food. Uh, I think the expansion of food service probably has a direct impact on the expansion of uh, health services as well, <laughs> Unf unfortunately. Uh, one of the things that I was... One of the things that I was thinking about was if you did say if women started staying home and taking care of children, then would that create a vacuum, like a labor vacuum that would just suck more immigrants into That's... the community to fill the jobs? But really, I think so many of the jobs that exist exist because women aren't doing their traditional uh, work at home and so there's more need for those services to be carried out by a third party like child care Tradi like cooking traditional roles no matter what they are are simply not commodifiable enough hence why in our age everything was commodified so it can be its own industry the entrepreneurial mindset has always been about finding problems even the most inconvenience smallest of inconveniences and find ways to sell solutions. I mean, look at the outsourcing for all our jobs. It also relates to, oh, you can't cook your food? Well, just buy this. Can't take care of children? Just hire this. Maximum convenience. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to move on uh, right quick um, because I think we could spend a lot of time uh, talking about the intersection of uh, sort of the family and uh, uh, the economy and the commodification of uh, what used to be uh, traditional familial duty. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about, because I think this is a common uh, talking point in regards to the effect of immigration on the labor market, is there's often a lot of talk thrown around about, well, what about migrant farm labor? And a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these immigrants are just migrant farmers. They just they just come in, you know, and they 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 pick our fields and and uh, you know we can't. Uh, we can't kick these people out because gringos are too uppity to get in the fields and uh, and pick pick strawberries or whatever you know they make them do. And um, uh, you know I'd I'd like to I'd like to address that sort of talking point uh, because I think it is you know it is important to think about how one of the last sort of uh, menial labor jobs that's left is is people picking uh, picking produce that can't necessarily be uh, mechanized very easily. Um, so did anyone want to sort of tackle that that talking point? Sounds like a great job. I don't know I don't know why Americans wouldn't want to do it. The ideal job all day. is seems to be oh, well um it looks on, like on the issue it looks of... like I accidentally paused myself and I don't know where the recording stopped. Oh, I hate myself. Oof. We're just, you know what? It says like one. It says like one eleven. So whatever we lost, it probably wasn't very much. Um, just to just to reiterate, um, the uh, what Clive said in case it wasn't uh, picked up. Uh, Clive expressed uh, incred incredulity that anyone could continue to believe the narrative that. Uh, Americans, there are jobs Americans simply won't do. It just has to do with, uh, you know, wages provided. And uh, I suggested that, um, that uh, of course, this is the case. And um, I, I actually, I'm, I'm starting to blank on what I, what I said in response. Um, and, and you were saying that we have a patriotic duty to yeah. uh, uh, pick our own produce. Yeah, it's, it seems, it seems as if there is no self-respecting country in the world. You know, there should not be a self-respecting country in the world that does not produce its own food and does not, you know, and, and relies on waves of random people from other countries to come over and literally pick their food off of the plant and, and, and feed it to them. Um, it just, that seems a little bit absurd. I don't know. Uh, Kongzi, go ahead. Well, yes, you, you all are right. And um, it is ridiculous to suggest such a thing, but um, it's not a uniquely American issue. Around the world, we are seeing that um, more and more we have these weird associations with race and what job you have to do. Like, for instance, now we have this weird association with being white and having to do some, co some sort of managerial middle-class job. Um, in fact, in a lot of third world nations, it's seen as white people work to become, let's say, an engineer. And so that kind of thing is looked down upon. And instead of hiring local engineers, they will hire whites from abroad to fill that same, um, that same position that someone from their own nation, you know, may, um, may do. You see this in places like Singapore, for example, where they have a highly educated local populace but will still hire large amounts of expats, for example. So I don't think it's a uniquely American issue. It's just that in other places, it works differently for... Um, so in the US, you will see more foreigners working in those, especially immigrants in those um, agricultural fields. But then in, as well, you see in, in, uh, in, um, in Silicon Valley, there's a large amount of... Um, immigrant workers in there as well, except how to put it. It's it's just, it's different there, but it's a, a broader issue. And I think it's more generational than necessarily national because with the rising rates of people being educated and people being university educated, 
you will develop a higher expectation for what kind of employment you'll get. And I think this whole millennial, I can't speak for Gen Xers or boomers, but the millennials are like the best educated generation. You know, um, I can't speak for statistics, but I think a large amount of millennials have some degree of tertiary education. And I think that a large amount of millennials simply do not want to do that kind of work. Well, that may, that may be true. Um... And part of this is the the cultural moment, the cultural uh, narrative that we've been pushed as millennials growing up is what is good, what is good work, what does it mean to uh, better yourself and set yourself up for the future. And we've always been told that that's education. We've been told that if you decide not to go to college and you decide to do a trade, that's some sort of succumbing or that's some sort of, um, you know, not doing as good as you could be because it was education was great for the boomers and it was pretty good for the, the extras. Um, it was always going to be the thing that we're, you're supposed to do when you graduate. Um, so I think it's, it's less on us and more on like what the, and obviously it's on us. So like we, young adults making their own decisions. And not, well, and I think mm-hmm. generations of being told that picking the fields is a Mexican thing to do um, does has that kind of like self-fulfilling prophecy aspect to it. Where if you tell generations of white people that they're too good to uh, pick peaches or, or you know what the hell ever, then mm-hmm. surprise, surprise, they won't pick peaches, uh, and they'll yeah. de- and they'll develop these these weird superiority complexes. I personally mm-hmm. think that white people are too good to not pick peaches. Uh, and maybe that's a, you know, maybe that's a weird opinion, but, um, you know, that's, that's, um, well, that... I, I don't think that's crazy. I don't think that's a crazy thing to say. Hyde Khan. There's a, a famous example that in, um, Japan, there are a lot of, uh, limitations on import of rice. And the result of that is that buying rice in Japan is relatively more expensive than it otherwise would be. And also, there are many Japanese people in Japan that grow rice. Pretty well, simple. And I think you and, might, um, I, I think we can take a lot of cues uh-huh. from uh, Japan in, in some respects uh, regarding these economic trends, some alone, although not in others. Anime. Yeah, d- 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 <laughs> we, we should the have, heresy. We, we should have closed the borders with Japan uh, once anime was invented. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't take my statement as me blaming millennials for their situation. I think a large part of that generational sort of mentality is the fact that they, 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 they don't know any different because they were educated to hold a certain viewpoint when it came to getting careers. Like, I don't want to fall into the boomer meme of just making fun of millennials for being lazy or whatever because they were told that if they just got a university education, you know, that would sort out their their problems, but that's just not how market systems work. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's really not the way ours is working. Generations at all. Um, we can move past that. Um, I do... I do want to go ahead and go on to the next topic because I, th- I think we're uh, we're reaching a point in the discussion where we might want to start wrapping it up by moving towards uh, discussion of solutions, um, which uh, I know is an is an uncomfortable thought because as as many of us expressed before we began this discussion, um, uh, we're not a lot of us are not very confident, uh, so to speak. But the the one last thing I do want to touch on is, let's say, you know, the worst case scenario happens and the whole world becomes like uh, South Africa, right? Where there is this, there is this um, extremely wealthy, uh, extremely powerful uh, class of people that owns the robots that make all the stuff. And they live in these gated communities with security guards to protect them from the unwashed masses. And there's the unwashed masses out there. And maybe they get a UBI check, maybe they don't. Probably doesn't, you know, provide them a standard of living that's comparable to uh, today, which might be a topic that we get into about standard of living and do people have, um, you know, do people have outsized expectations of, of what people should be provided in life. But, you know, that's a separate issue, I think, for right now, so we're going to bracket it off, but 
let's say the worst case scenario occurs. What does what do these advanced economies do with this superfluous workforce? And you know, before answering this question, um, you know, we might address the the question of do machine economies, do economies that are completely mechanized, do they really need consumers? And this is something that, uh, like I said, if you, if you look at that Economics Explained video, um, he comes down on the side of suggesting that they do not. And uh, I'm uh, inclined to ag agree in some respects that uh, the rise of the post-automation sort of post-scarcity economy might actually bring about the end of consumerism uh, to connect it to our last discussion and bring about something uh, infinitely worse. Um, so uh, does anyone want to anyone want to tackle that? The question is basically what would such a society do with its superfluous workforce and and why do you think so? So well, I, all I would have to say on this is um, there's a reason why some of our elites are very supportive of anti-natalist belief systems. I wonder if some of them may already be aware of what the future could hold, and they simply want to move away from having too much people that are no longer useful. And so I guess the future, if they are on the winning scale in this sense, would be the world will have a much less population, and the elites essentially just play their games with each other. Right, I... I feel like it, you know maybe we won't end up with anything um, uh, too dramatic, but you you might think of something like I don't know if anyone's read the uh, like the OG Tom Clancy uh, Rainbow Six novel, um, but the uh, the whole plot of that novel is that they're they're uh, they're trying to expose a cell of eco terrorists who are going to. Um, release a killer virus to uh, kill off all of humanity. And that's a book. But it's it's not, you know, that much of a stretch to say, you know, well, you know, what if what if in this like weird messed up materialistic mechanistic um, you know, uh, analysis of human life and the machine age the powers that be decide that actually just culling the population would be a better move. Well, I can't say if there's going to be, you know, that scenario where they just cull the population. But... I don't think it's very likely, hmm. but it is something you might... Uh... Not, a, not a cull, a slow antinatalist decline. I, I get where you're coming works. from, that spot. That but, only um, works in the civilized world, though. It does, won't work in the third world. And if you reduce birth rates and population in the first world, you're just going to get wave upon wave of immigration from the third world. Ah, yeah, but really, that would be the plan. Isn't our situation already in this conversation specifically a hypothetical, the post-scarcity machine economy is here, and the whole world is Johannesburg? Well, and I, and I might also add that... Um, uh, this is something I believe we've discussed before, living being, but uh, there there has been some work in sociology that suggests that even as these uh, th even as these so-called third world or developing countries uh, uh, urbanize very quickly, that their birth rates quickly uh, decline um, and come to some kind of parity uh, with the West, even though they um, even though they high con that is. That is exactly the point I wanted to bring up because um, even though it looks like these third world nations, the, the birth rate is exploding for now. But look at what happened in China, for example. In um, the early 1900s, China had a, a ridiculous birth rate, like huge population explosion, even, even into the early Mao era. And now, even though they have this massive population, it seems to be shrinking. You know, even in India, the the birth rate is, is slowing down, and yeah, I believe the I, Indian birth this rate even is in... now below replacement. Yeah, and um, I think as African economies end up getting more and more integrated into the global, modern po post scarcity 
sort of system will see something very similar. In fact, I'm willing to bet in more urbanized parts of Africa and the third world, um, especially among the upper classes, you have much lower birth rates. I'm, I can't say for sure, and I don't have any um, sources on this, but it's just a hypothesis. So yeah, uh, uh, take that, living being. <laughs> but um, so I, I don't want to be that one guy who quotes Marx here, but um, according to Marx, guy. there must always be a labor force to um, to exploit, and I don't think um, the like the machines will take over from us or something, because a a, a machine, you know. A machine in its purpose must serve humanity in some sense, even if it's in a twisted, in a twisted way, you know, where it doesn't actually benefit us. So I don't see that. I don't see the system completely culling the human element, but instead, what I see is something to the tune of um, something to the tune of like increased um, consumerism, where we instead of going from just normal consumerism, we go into a state of hyper consumption. And and the uh, the end result of such hyper consumption may be the the consumption of ourselves, so to speak. My my approach to this, if I were if I were the hypothetical big bad, uh, you know, if I'm Bill Gates and the Illuminati, and I'm I'm looking over the world that I've created. Um, you know, the, the thing is that it's it seems to be, and I'm going to, you know, go with um, some of the things that have been, um, you know, some of the things that have emerged as a result of particular illness that has spread throughout the world in recent years is that, or in recent uh, months, I should say, uh, it seems to be that populations, especially in developed countries, seem very willing to just roll over and do whatever the government tells them to do. Um, on very shaky pretexts, uh, generally with the support of like a blanket media propaganda campaign. And we already have countries in the West where euthanasia is not only legal, but an encouraged avenue for those who are terminally ill. Um, and there's even uh, some countries where they will allow euthanasia for those who are uh, just really depressed and want to kill themselves. Although, you know, that's that's a rare situation at this point. But I do I don't see uh, why it couldn't be the case that going into the future, there's this sort of combination approach where what we do is we, um, you know, we make it as easy as possible for people to sterilize themselves. We make it as easy as possible for people to get access to contraception. We actively punish people through economic incentives for having children, uh, for having you know more than one or two children, whatever the case may be. Um, and then as the population is slowly declining, uh, we also add in the, the, you know, the added effect of, are you depressed? Just kill yourself. Are, are you terminally sick? Just kill yourself. Um, and, you know, through that process of uh, retarding the birth rates through, the, through a combination of economic pressure and just the sheer availability of um, ways to sterilize oneself um, and combine that with the ability to just off yourself whenever you feel like life is too hard, um, like legally sanctioned by the state, it, it doesn't seem like too much of a stretch to say that we might not arrive at a point where the human population would reach uh, a, a so-called balance or equilibrium where there are enough people to run the machine economy, to do the things that robots just can't possibly do um, at, at the moment, right? And you, you have this stable population and you, you're good. You know, you've solved the you've solved the equation of human existence, so to speak. At least as I'm sitting and looking at it from sort of this, uh, you know, uh, bird's eye perspective, as uh, you know, the secret ruler of the world. That's what I would do. So I, I don't know any any objections to that to that sort of scheme. Well, with the whole anti-natalist thing, um. 
I think they're using anti-natalism in a very insidious way. So instead of discouraging, how to put it, instead of dis- because their anti-natalism is very different from the anti-natalism of Chiron or Michael Stader, who are nihilists and anarchists to the extreme. You know, it's it's not that. It's a very mushy, liberal, accepting nihil like it's nihilistic in a different way than than the you know the nihilistic strains of thought that grew up grew in the um the early 1920s and i think what they're encouraging is a sort of nihilistic viewpoint where one lives to consume or how they would put it lives for happiness or lives for oneself but at the end of the day i think human population will reproduce enough just to to consume if that makes any sense i mean that's i think that's definitely a possible future if anyone else well, has but, go ahead i mean I, I was gonna say ultimately you know a, a minute ago you were talking about everyone becoming consumerist if there's no jobs for them to do but ultimately you can't be a consumerist if you don't have access to resources and if you, in the long run, you know, in the short run, if you don't have a job, then society maybe will send you transfer payments or, you know, universal basic income or something. But in the long run, if you don't, if, if you don't have any way of getting resources, then being a consumerist is unsustainable. Right. And I'm, I'm suggesting, uh, maybe Kongzi isn't suggesting this, but I'm suggesting that consumerism ultimately dies, like, you know, w- once... Once you have this popu- this dependent population that you have to give UBI to, once they're dead in sixty to eighty years, um, yeah. you just tra- you you just the people that work at the different companies that own the machines they just trade with themselves. They keep the population low through um, through contraceptive efforts, and um, they they reach a, a certain uh, equilibrium. That that's what you I mean. Like a rat park. You mean like a rat park equilibrium. A rat park equilibrium. Um, yeah, the sort of a mouse utopia. utopia. Yeah, okay, yep. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, like a mouse utopia equilibrium, so to speak. Well, you know what happened is that some of when they gave the rats everything that they needed provided for them, then some of them became like monk rats and they hid away in their little rooms grooming themselves and not interacting with any of the other rats. And some of them are like hung around like bums around the theater, and those are like your your UBI class, you know. And they never made it or anything. Neither did the monk mice. Eventually, they entirely died out. So I'm not sure. Well, well, well and I'm that, not but... I'm not precluding that as a possibility either, because you know, in this sort of post scarcity, post you know, post mechanized economy. Not only do you have the fact that like human beings are basically like worthless, they don't do anything. They just they just consume whatever um, value the machines um, you know produce. And maybe there's a few people that are involved in the running of the machines, but at histor- you know in histor- by historical standards, it's a very small portion of the human population that even does anything, right? So you know, I'm not precluding the fact that this just descends into nihilistic chaos where you know every, everyone either dies or um or you know there's some kind of uh collapse as a result of this but right. i i think that it's very likely to be the case that if if you set out with this goal in mind of making this uh you know fully automated luxury space communism that uh you know this is the route you would take well um so I, I, I agree with Hyde Con, your, your general sort of theorem. I just wanted to, you know, um, sort of explain some of the nuances I think are very important to explore when it comes to this topic. But um, I don't think it'll be as simple as... Um, so when I mean consumerist, I don't mean people are just going to be standing there consuming, but they're probably going to be given, you know... Um, currency and re- or quote-unquote resources through some pointless menial um how to put it um like like work, work that doesn't matter 
Do you, do you mean um, a sinecure? <laughs> like, if you all ever watch your Jetsons, you know, he just presses a button every day. It's, it's something like that. Now that's something that could only be forced by entities that are not completely bound by market interests. Yeah, I, I, th I think Despot has a point here. Like this would this would suggest that there's some sort of entity that's that's saying actually no guys you have to give them something to do. Basically, a forceful entity like a state or anything similar that is motivated purely by belief systems to say no the world must be like this. If you say otherwise, you'll have to disappear or something. That's from Nick Land, right? The whole capital ascension thing. I mean it. Possibly, I've never read Land. Uh, maybe that makes me a, a bad dissident that I've, I, you know, I haven't read Land. Um, if nobody just do a lot of amphetamines and move to China, <laughs> and you'll understand. I'll understand He's a type perfect. Of guy. You don't have to read him. Um, so if anybody, if nobody else has anything to add on the, on that sort of like, I think we're all agreed that what uh, future capital will do with the superfluous labor is not good things. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add there. Uh, right. It, it might eventually reach some kind of um, halfway decent uh, equilibrium, maybe. Uh, and it could also take a thousand years of chaos to get there. Right. Um, so I would now... make a subtle correction that we shouldn't speak of this in defeatist terms, terms of what they will do or what they might do or they could do. Um, yeah. Because we do have the ability to change the culture, and we do have the ability, we do have hope, um, etc. Of course, of course, oh. and I, I think this is a very optimistic. Um, this is very optimistic on on their part because it relies on basically, you know, if I was them, right, this would be an optimistic prognostication on their part because this relies on basically everything they do going completely correct and and having no sort of unintended consequences or uh you know things that come back to bite them in the ass which absolutely never happens in real life so i must say there is benefit in assuming that the enemy will win completely because then in that process you can think of plans of how to stop each individual hypothetical perfect success and i, I just wanted to um sort of say this but um I don't think the Illuminati, like the quote-unquote Illuminati yeah, or I'm whoever, just, I'm just being, you know, the evil people with I'm moustaches who are rubbing their hands and plotting this out, um, I don't think they're doing it out of evil intentions. I think they're trying to bring about what they see as some sort of utopia. I think they're fundamentally idealists. And with these utopians, they're willing to do whatever it takes to achieve what they see as correct. Um, so let's go ahead. Let's move on. So we've, we've talked about the whole problem. We've talked about automation. We've talked about automation as it dovetails with uh, immigration and um, to some extent with globalization. Um, I think we'll, we'll get more to the globalization when I talk about you know, my suggested solutions. Uh, but, but really, what I want to talk about is the, the right-wing response to all of these, um, all these sorts of economic um, uh, trends. Specifically, I want to talk about how the the right wing is sort of the de facto um, political representation for the working class in this situation. It it almost seems like uh, we like switch from the uh, the losing from one losing horse to another in any given uh, <laughs> particular political paradigm. It's like we were we were with the nobility and the aristocracy. And then World War One happened, and liberalism happened, and it all just collapsed and, and crapped itself. And then uh, now, in this weird, uh, in this in this weird sort of globalized uh, economic paradigm that we're in, now we we find ourselves, um, you know, like having to represent the working class who are just getting pummeled by global techno capital. And it's it's just like we we decided that we wanted to do politics on hardcore mode. I, I what I mean by that is is more of a joke. I know that there are, there are particular like um, sort of um, I, or um, ideological reasons why you back one horse and in 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 particular paradigms. But I I do just find that funny. 
Um, this is not, this is actually not so strange. If I looked at history, many traditionalists and reactionary forces, they were essentially friendly with aristocrats and with certain workers. Their <laughs> eternal enemy has been the always the bourgeoisie. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. The we are the true Marxists. Merchants, GTFO. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I I I want to to hit a couple of points, and then I think we can call it a night. Um, I don't want to go too much longer, but you know, here are the points I want to hit. So one is that we need to solve the glut of labor. There's there's too much labor. Um, and we're going to focus particularly on the American context. There's too much labor in the American labor market. It is it's it's hurting the uh, working and middle classes, and we have to, you know, there, we have to figure out something to do about it. Um, then you know what is the proper posi- what is the proper position of a right wing or a dissident right wing uh, movement in regards to automation? Like how how do we approach the 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 fact that uh, there's going to be autonomous trucks that put 30 million people out of a job, and there's going to be intense political and economic pressure to adopt this technology. And at some point, like, is it even possible for us to just sit there and say, no, we're not going to? Um, maybe, maybe not. You know, maybe that's a point of discussion. Um, you know, and, and piggybacking off of that, is it time to move past? capitalism as we understand it as a paradigm so in effect do we need an economy with different priorities i would argue yes and i could expound upon that later um and then of course there's always the question of how do we achieve it and we'll i think we'll close out with our own particular predictions of how this is going to play out in the future um but uh, i think we should start with the the glut of labor problem if anyone has any solutions they'd like to put forward. Well, since everyone's been quiet, um, I will start, I guess. And um, In the American context especially, I've been reading up lately a lot on, um, If I don't know if you all are familiar with Huey Long and the Every Man a King movement. Yeah. And I think that sort of grassroots sort of focusing on making instead in, like a form of socialism where instead of um focusing on destroying the bourgeoisie and it's, it instead focuses on empowering every family and every man to be self-sufficient with it, and every community to be self-sufficient and i think with the whole automation thing how we could instead of going full-on luddite what we could what i think would happen is that there will be some kind of new artisan sort of class that use automated technology to create specialized sort of goods within a society. Okay. And I've seen things to this effect too. I like, um, I've read things about neighborhoods that have put in like, uh, communal workshops that have like, automated lathes and uh and various other machinery that you would you would see in like a a specialized craft workshop um you know for community use so i i think that's sort of uh i think that's an interesting um an interesting word neo artisanal artisanism maybe i don't know <laughs> neo autism i don't know <laughs> but uh neo autism but but that um you know that that is it's an interesting possibility and i think just because things sound you know weird or not like what we're used to i don't think we should dismiss it out of hand because we are going into a weird future um any anybody else have anything to say well my answer is too complicated for the time we have left oh. so i probably would not be sh- sharing too much of it i'm i'm thinking of giving something it that entire... demands I'm thinking of giving it, an entire convivium to Despot sometime to just... To, it to requires just... endless writing, but uh, <laughs> my general view is um, whatever plan you want to do, understand that your biggest opponents are moving in one direction, and you want to move at another, in which the mere act that you need to build what you want does, must have within its plan a means of destroying the opponent. 
because um the biggest problem with many of the traditionalist ideas of trying to return to tradition from the more idealistic people who don't think too much about the logistics behind it is that even if you create your idealistic small little farm home that many the wheat fields that many idealize about being treated more like a joke to be fair it's still in the grand scheme of geopolitical power heavily outcompeted so um anything that requires building the thing that is on the spot must be destroyed first that's a that's a fair point a good point to keep in mind anybody else How competed before? at what scale in just the game of power i guess because in which list that cares more about the community and about like small local sort of environments and building into their hometown people who are building a you know uh, a bedford falls they care more about bedford, bedford falls and they're not trying to compete on a global level with the, with the rochesters and the new york mm -hmm. city um, and that's so, that seems to be the big issue because in they are failing on a global scale is to evaluate them on a on a level that they're not playing at mm -hmm. now that's the that's the big problem it's kind of hard to desire to be localists when the whole world and its power structures take an interest at every single inch of the planet sure um you have to deliberately set yourself up to be counteracting those forces as they come close to you mm -hmm. um, but the extent that you can building a localized society is useful and i i'm not going to say that the the benedict option is the way we should all go or that it doesn't have its flaws but mm -hmm. we shouldn't evaluate the success or failure of a traditionalist community like bedford falls on whether or not they can compete on a global scale to defeat to defeat a global enemy requires a global battlefield even if the goal is to create more localist societies that front is still there i agree and this is where i begin talking about uh neo-feudal distributed hydroponic machine autarky um which Mercy. is which, <laughs> which, which is a which is a meme title for something that i've talked about in in the uh canis society server before but uh essentially it's it's the idea and i i loved uh the uh the ryan falk video that clive um linked me to um about the 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 question of economic uh, autarky and his uh, his response to globalization, uh, so that that'll be in the description as well. And I obviously I don't it, I don't agree with or endorse everything that Ryan Falk's ever said, but this particular who would I well <laughs> that's fair, but um, but uh, I thought this particular take was very good, um, and is it, you know essentially as I understand it, you know the solving the glut of labor i think well first of all there's a couple of things you could do right is that you could claw back as best as you can the normalization of women in the workforce um that's not to say that women can't work jobs or you put some kind of draconic draconian law in place that says if if you're a woman and you're caught working we're going to stone you or you know something crazy like that but as a, as a society we need to move in the direction of saying actually no uh we don't we don't want our uh, women to have to work um for a family of four to survive uh we actually just want you to pay the husband a living wage uh so that they can have a, a normal family um and if you are loud enough and forceful enough about that social expectation, and if you have enough people come on board, uh, enough people with talent and expertise, then you might get somewhere. I'm, I'm not super optimistic about it, but you know it can't hurt to try, and it's definitely something that we need to try anyway, uh, just for the for the good of for the good of our children, if nothing else. Um, so that's one thing you could do, and then the next thing you could do, I mean, just be obvious, right? It's like stop bringing more people into the country just just stop just just pass a law that says like no more people indefinitely ever just you know you can come visit you can get a travel visa and, and you know hang out and buy stuff and uh you know take your 10 gallon hat back to france or wherever you're from uh but <laughs> we we don't need it we could we could build some kind of big beautiful wall 
and try to get another country to pay for it. We could, we could, we very well could, and you Make know, the French pay for it. Well, here's the thing, right? Is that France? Uh, what is it? Ghana just turned down a bunch of French foreign aid. Uh, maybe we should get that French foreign aid and use that to Beast. build the wall. Uh, <laughs> but you know, Ghana is going nas <laughs> But no, like seriously, um, <clears throat> is that if you're some if you're like, if you're a right-winger looking at the situation, there is absolutely no reason why you should not go, like, both feet in, diving from the diving board with the pronouncement of no more immigration. Like, it should be like a campaign slogan, like, read my lips, no more immigration. Zero. Literally <laughs> none. Um, because we don't need any more. And the only thing that more immigration is going to do, skilled or unskilled, is drive down the wages of of you know native born americans or even the immigrants that are already here because there's no getting rid of them right um and let's not forget a lot of these a lot of these immigrants don't have it easy either a lot of them get exploited and mistreated and it's not good for them either it's good for no one yeah i'm, I'm not saying like i hate them and like i don't want them here because i hate them it's it obviously not it's more like well first of all they could do more good you know back home, uh, you know, building their own country, uh, doing their own thing. Mexicans being Mexican in Mexico is perfectly fine, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's also the fact that, you know, what is a country for? And we, we've been laboring under this uh, false impression that a country is a, an economy and a GDP with uh, an army. Um, but that's not what it is, right? A country is made up of people. And the government of that country has obligations to the people of that country and not the GDP of that country or you know, the economy of that country. And it very well might be that what is in the best interest of the people of that country, um, specifically the most vulnerable people in that country, is to take an economic hit. And I'm not even convinced that it is an economic hit, right? You know, whatever high number you have as, as your GDP – um, if you've got a, like a majority of people in your country living paycheck to paycheck that can't afford like a $400 auto repair bill, um, that's not an economy that works. Uh, it, it's, that's, yeah. it, it, and I just want to be clear, I mean, I mean the, the way you phrased that was take an economic hit, but I mean, really we're talking about potentially a hit to GDP, potentially a hit to the stock market. But we're talking about um, wages increasing. We're talking about more families having stay-at-home mom. Right. What we're talking about is that the stock market is not the economy. The GDP is not the economy. The economy mm -hmm. is people procuring the goods and services that they need to survive. And the easier we can make that, the better of an economy that we have, like, you know, to my mind. The easier that it is for um, people in this country, uh, specifically, you know, native-born Americans, citizens, uh, but also uh, just, um, you know, to some extent, anyone living in the country, um, is 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 that the best? We don't. We shouldn't measure the merits of an economy on GDP, on GDP growth on stock market values, on strength of the dollar against various currencies. What we need to measure it on is the general economic well-being of, uh, you know, the, the average or lower, uh, or lower, you know, lower middle class or working class member of society. Um, if they can have a decent life and they can provide for themselves and their family with dignity, and people respect them, and people respect their right to be able to do that, then you have an economy that works, in, to my mind. And it doesn't matter what your GDP is. If your GDP is, you know, terrible, that's fine, as long as it's working for those people, for the you know, sort of bread and butter of your country. For, frankly, right, when your country goes to war, those are the people that either go themselves or send their sons to die. Okay, and yeah. if you're gonna run a country, you need to do right by those people. Um, 
and and that that to me is the economic uh, paradigm shift that we need to have not like you, you know a lot of people get into autistic conversations of like oh we're going to go uh, you know, socialist, or we, you know, we get like Nazball gang guys. Are like, no, we don't have to do that. We just have to set our priorities in order, um, and we have to realize that this experiment that we've been doing in the, in in materialistic, you know, hyper uh, hyper efficient capitalism that just does, literally gives not a single shit about the well being of of actual people. This is an experiment that has failed, and it will produce terrible results, and we should get off the train uh, before the brakes uh, are broken. Very well said. You should take exactly what you said in the last two minutes and put it into its own video. Uh, well done. Maybe, <laughs> perhaps. But, um, you know, that's, that's, really my, that's really my two cents. And I, I honestly have – I have hope that, that a, an economy like that an economy like, uh, like Kongzi was saying, like a Huey Long, chicken in every pot, car in every driveway, every man kind of uh, economic policy, would do well for a right wing movement, and I think we could find success doing that, if if for no other reason than there are just more people getting shit on by the current system then there are people willing to support it, even with the vast amounts of propagandizing and this I I silly notion that people have have baked into everyone's head that if you can potentially possibly do something and use a technology to some end, you have to do it. If there's a technology that exists that does something, you have to see what it does. You have to incorporate it into your society and just live with it now. And that's not true. Um, it's just not. And you know, this is I, – I feel like this is a, a further stage of looking at the programming and being able to say, actually, no. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have to go along with all this, uh, you know, for lack of a better world, all this like neoliberal zeitgeist bullshit. Um, it's, it's, just a bunch of, it's just a bunch of stuff people made up, right? Um, and it may seem – like this is some kind of incontravenable rule of history, but that's just because we're looking at it through this fundamentally skewed paradigm. At least that's that's the way I would look at it. And we believe that there is nothing other than, uh, you know, consumerist, uh, hyper material, techno capital. Uh, there's there could be nothing other, and I I just don't agree. Right. And I think, you know, what Despot has said, right, that you have to take into account the geopolitical um, you know, aspects of these things. I, I think that's true. But I also think there's there's a lot of value in having the allegiance of the people who are, like I said, the sort of salt of the earth, bread and butter type people. That doesn't mean that they're all like, you know, not necessarily virtuous or anything, but they are uh, at their core. You know these uh, lower middle middle working class people are people who have experience in the real world, uh, who have had contact with the system, who understand its its limitations, who understand you know, the way that uh, the way they've been shafted um, by frankly not some kind of uh, you know they've been shafted not by some kind of like law of physics or law of history. They've been shafted by people doing specific activities. I, that's that's the way I would put it. Does, does anybody else have any closing thoughts? I think you put it very well. I mean, yeah, I mean, um, I think there'll always be a certain, um, like a certain small amount of immigration and population exchange. We've seen this, we've seen this all throughout history. But I, I think the key is to really, like, we have to think about economics and why are economics important. I think the key to having a good economic system is it's, it's, I, I see economics as a tool, uh, a tool to help upkeep those values that make up our society. And ultimately I think our economics should be subservient to Western values. Absolutely. Um, Clive, did you have anything to add? No, I think you put that beautifully, Hadkan, and I think that is a message 
um, that potentially uh, I think is uh, I think is is very appealing to a lot of people. Thank you, uh, Despot. Any any uh, Despot or living being? Any any thoughts before we? I still have things to think about myself, but generally, what I'm trying to figure out is because of my particular view, which focuses on power realism and power is like way to guide people. How I like to think of things is finding a way to combine power interests with whatever viewpoint you hold to create systems where the two can work together. Because oftentimes the biggest problem that causes, let's say, moral hazards within people's decision making is when power interests and people's intended causes contradict each other. Mm. And that is, that is something to keep in mind. Uh, living being, do you have any thoughts? Um, I don't know if I have anything to add. It, it sounds like what you're proposing is a sort of reactionary populist. I mean, I mean, yeah, like n nothing that I've said, I guess, is, is anything that would be weird, like at a, at a meeting of, I guess, particularly erudite Trump supporters, right? Which, Honestly, I I, th I think we are technically. <laughs> so um, so yeah. If if nobody else has anything else to add, um, I think we could we could close out here and say we've had a we've had a good a good discussion. So um, uh, before the mm, awkward silence so extends anymore, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you all. Thank you all for participating. All right. Thanks, John. I, I, I loved all of your inputs, and I hope to see you again uh, soon. And thank you all uh, who are watching. Uh, thank you for for sitting through this this big um, uh, this big uh, conversation of ours. And we we hope to bring you more interesting topics in the future. Uh, but for now, this has been the Hidebound Convivium. Uh, God bless and good night.